A scientist is someone who systematically gathers evidence to test a hypothesis to gain understanding. Sometimes, scientists can easily gather evidence simply by watching things change in front of their eyes. If I wanted evidence about what happens when you add vinegar to baking soda, I can just put the two together and watch the way they change. But some evidence is hard to gather without technology. We have invented microscopes to help us watch how very tiny things interact. And we've invented telescopes so that we can watch how very large things interact. But what if we're trying to observe something we can't see? Some things are too far away, like galaxies. Some things are too small, like atoms. Some things are blocked from view, like the center of the sun. Some things move too fast, like light. And some things move too slow, like the cosmos. How can we gather evidence to study all of these things? Typically, when we think of science, we think of experimental science. This is the type of science where we intentionally cause a reaction or identify a reaction that's happening naturally and repeatedly observe it under different conditions. These days, some of the most famous experimental science is conducted on massive scales, requiring expensive equipment and thousands of researchers. We commonly hear about the Large Hadron Collider and the Hubble Space Telescope. Experimental science is only one method to do scientific research, though. Until recently, all of the scientific questions we had that we couldn't directly measure through experimentation were relegated to an area of science called theoretical science. Many of the most famous scientists, like Albert Einstein and Stephen Hawking, are theoretical scientists. For a theoretical scientist, their laboratory is their mind, and it can be difficult for other people to see their experiments. But in the past several decades, thanks to the rise of powerful computers, scientific research has changed dramatically. We are now able to create virtual laboratories with computer code that can simulate scientific events that are impossible to observe in the real world, without having the information trapped in the mind of a great philosopher. This is why many people refer to computational scientific research as the third pillar of modern science, alongside the other two pillars of experimental and theoretical science. One of the first non-military applications for supercomputers was solving Einstein's equations of general relativity. These equations are mathematically laborious to solve, but help provide insight into how black holes work. From there, the astrophysics community contributed quite a lot to the growth of the field of high-performance computing, or HPC, showing scientists many phenomena that they couldn't observe through telescopes. Soon, the geophysics community joined the HPC field, studying earthquakes, the climate, and doing predictive simulation of extreme weather events. While astrophysics research largely relied on purely mathematical data, Geophysics research was able to feed supercomputer simulations with real measurements from seismometers, thermometers, barometers, and other Earth-based sensors. This simulation of Hurricane Katrina was based on measured data of the conditions in the Atlantic Ocean. It was churning on a supercomputer at the National Center for Atmospheric Research at the same time the hurricane was actually happening. This simulation was actually racing the real storm to anticipate the most likely path and power of the hurricane to prepare an emergency response. As supercomputers got more powerful, they began to be useful to biophysics researchers as well. One of the ways these researchers use these computational microscopes is to observe how viruses like HIV, HPV, polio, and influenza function on a mechanical level at the resolution of individual atoms. These dynamics would be impossibly small and fast to observe through an optical microscope. Today, high-performance computing is experiencing another renaissance. Supercomputers are being used to prescribe genetically customized medicine to individual patients. Political scientists can calculate a set of all possible voting district maps to help identify unfair partisan gerrymandering. And plant scientists are breeding virtual crops under conditions of elevated carbon dioxide and limited water, future climate scenarios that don't currently exist on this planet but which could dramatically affect humanity's ability to feed itself. These new sciences have only recently been able to leverage HPC resources as computers grow more powerful and the HPC industry learns from experience. For instance, simulating plant growth requires an understanding of climate, 
plant anatomy, genetics, and the physics of atoms. All phenomena that happen at vastly different scales of space and time, and all which require expertise from different kinds of scientists. Often, when trying to tell a science story, we will encounter science that is constrained by even the most modern computers. This volcano on the surface of Venus had to be an illustration guided by the advice of a scientist because no computer simulation of an appropriate volcanic eruption existed. And this blast of solar plasma colliding with the Earth's magnetic field was so enormous that the scientists couldn't afford to keep all of the data in three dimensions, which is why we transitioned to a 2D extraction from the data instead. The computational datasets that are available today provide unparalleled insight into a wide variety of scientific questions that could never be addressed by physical experimentation or observation. And as the field of high-performance computing continues to advance, we will see more computational datasets in every corner of the public and private sectors. And one of the best ways to analyze and educate with this data is through visualization. Fun fact! In the 1980s, an American computational astrophysicist named Larry Smarr was tired of traveling to Germany to do all of his computational research. So he convinced the United States government to fund four new supercomputer centers, including one at his home institution in Illinois. That's the origin of the National Center for Supercomputing Applications, or NCSA, where we create our visualizations. One experiment the early NCSA astrophysicists ran was to analyze the effect of what would happen when black holes collide. They discovered that they would cause an aberration in space-time called a gravitational wave that would travel immense distance, and they theorized that Earth was regularly being shaken by gravitational waves. In 2015, an instrument called LIGO that was built to detect gravitational waves was turned on and first observed these waves in the real world, thereby validating the work of those computational scientists from 30 years earlier.